welcome, welcome. My name is Drew Shaw, and um, this is an event that um, is sort of aimed at reviving um, interest in literature and books and reading generally. And I'm very honoured to be um, accompanied by wonderful authors here today. I'll introduce them in a minute. And um, I so it's organised by the Centre for English Excellence and the Orange Elephant. Thanks to Violet and Paul who uh, are hosting this today. And uh, we hope that all of these books they are um, available in the. If you sort of these are some of mine, but they're all available in uh, the Orange Elephant bookstore. So if anyone wants to read up on some of the authors that you encounter today. All the books are available and uh, that would be lovely. Um, I'm going to just start off by introducing uh, all the writers over here. Uh, many of them are, uh, many of you know them already, but John Apple is a, is a veteran poet, novelist and short story writer, also very well known as an English teacher of over 50 years. Um, MA graduate of Missoula Natal University and his first novel DGG Buries the Great North Road won the MNET Prize in 1993. His poetry collection Spoils of War won the Ingrid Yonker Prize and Landlocked New and Selected Poems from Zimbabwe won the Poetry Workshop Prize judged by Billy Collins. Uh, he published 24 books and other novels include Hatchings, Absent the English Teacher, Traffickings, uh, and The Boy Who Loved Camping, many others. Some of his memorable characters, because today we're going to talk about how authors create characters. So this is a bit subjective, but I've selected just a few of my memorable characters from all of these authors. So Dyka Berry in DGG Berry's Great North Road. Uh, there's uh, Moral McBraggart in, um, in Hatchings, G George G. George in, and Beautitious uh, <coughs> Yaman Yakuna in uh, Absent the English Teacher, uh, Andrew Hondebrunt, Hondebrunt in Giraffe Man, uh, Bruce Cherry Snap and Pearly Gates, Foreign Yama, the judge in the Grand Stuffed Elephant Heist, which I'm currently reading in its diary, its uh, form on Facebook at the moment. I think there's quite a, there's been quite a following of um, some of uh, John's fictional writing uh, on Facebook, which is great to see. So uh, uh, that that's a brief introduction to John, uh, and I'll come back to all of the writers in a minute. Um, uh, Bryony. Bryony Reen is, um, has published short stories and in many anthologies and her first novel, The September Sun, topped the Amazon UK chart, being chosen also as the best first book at the Zimbabwe Book as the Publishers Association Awards and uh, it's also selected as an A-level text book in Zimbabwe which is a great honor. Um, MA graduate from Kent University, Bryony uh, was also a recipient of the Moreland Scholarship in 2018 and published her second uh, book, a detective novel titled All Come to Dust in 2020. And that won an Armour Award. Um, she attended Girls College and has taught English at Girls College where she is now deputy head. No. Senior mistress. Senior mistress, okay. Uh, so Bryony's risen through the ranks of Girls College and there's, there's quite a Girls College kind of theme related to Zimbabwe, Bulawayo literature. There's a, a lot of talent seems to come from there, as we, we might um, d discover later. Uh, some of her um, very memorable characters to me are Ellie um, in um, The September Sun, Right at the bottom of there, and uh, Gran or uh, Evelyn, uh, the grandmother, uh, and there are other characters as well in the, many characters in that novel. Uh, then in her second uh, second novel, detective uh, novel, uh, Chief Inspector Edmund Dube uh, and Craig Martin uh, are some of my most memorable characters from there. Um, 
Craig Martin an archetypal sort of pull away a man and quite a humorous character as well. So we'll come back to some of those. Uh, Sapiri, Gloria and Glovo. Uh, to my left over here, uh, was born in Bulawayo and also a girls college alumnus uh, who attended, I think, roughly the same time that John Apple was teaching there because John has taught at girls college and CBC intermittently. Um, later, I moved to the USA, um, also lived in Sweden for a time, I believe so. Um, but she obtained a PhD in modern thought and literature from Stanford University. Um, however, she returns to her hometown, which is fictionalized as the City of Kings in her first two novels, The Theory of Flight and The History of Man. And the former won the prestigious Barry Ronger Sunday Times Fiction Award in South Africa in 2019, and the latter was shortlisted. <clears throat> and like Bryony Ream, she was a recipient of a Moreland Scholarship, and she continues to write think uh, about to publish a third novel later this year and I'm trying to persuade her to launch it in Bulawayo as well as in <laughs> South Africa so I hope she's going to consider that. Um, memorable characters, how can we forget Jeannie in The Theory of Flight, uh, Galiri Gamedi, her father who builds a pair of beautiful golden wings, Vida otherwise known as Jesus um, and then Emil Kutsia in um, The History of Man. Uh, so we'll come back to some of her characters. Um, and then moving on to uh, Violette. So Violette Kitwe was also, um, grew up in Bulawayo and wrote for The Chronicle for many years. Uh, so those of you who've been Bulawayo people for a while would have would know her name from that. Uh, she became the Assistant Features Editor, Editor and won the Feature Writer of the Year Award in the National Journalism Awards and also won the Antoise Short Story Competition uh, for one of her short stories. Uh, then she wrote her first novel, Mulberry Dreams, uh, which is set and centered uh, in Bulawayo's diverse, distinctive colored community. Uh, which has proved popular and Violet is working on a second novel which is a sequel and she taught English at Christian Brothers College for a time and is now uh, proprietor here at the Orange Elephant with her partner Paul Hubbard. Um, so some of your characters, Violet, um, uh, well Emma is, is intriguing, uh, the protagonist of Mulberry Dreams uh, relatable for many uh, reasons and Calvin uh, is, is probably my most intriguing character from from Mulberry Dreams uh, a, a kind of prickly alluring a bit of a bad boy but also likable character um, and so that's a brief introduction to the authors um, I think I'm going to start off with a question for John um, uh, so John you're a noted satirist and um, there's a particular way that satirical characters are created. And I was just wondering if you could say some more about how they happen. How do you, how do you develop your characters? Some of them are very funny and they kind of seem um, to carry a message in some sense. They're quite, uh, um, they're, they're distinctive at, at any rate. Uh, can you say some more about what goes into Character creation with you. Well, I, first of all, satirists are more interested in the issues than the characters, so they tend to just use the characters to attack or represent certain issues that they feel strongly about, like say hypocrisy or um, self righteousness. So the characters in satires tend to be flat characters, caricatures. I sometimes describe myself as a verbal cartoonist. <laughs> um, so I'm more interested in attacking attitudes than developing characters uh, in, in, this, in the kind of detail that these three other writers do. Um, uh, I, but of course, what you, what you sometimes get with a novelist like Dickens, for instance, 
is the mixture of flat characters and round characters. This is a, these are the terms that Ian e. Forster uses to describe the two. Um, so round characters are, com are complex characters who change. So in Great Expectations, for instance, Pip is, is a complex character um, because he, he loses his innocence. He realizes what he is and he grows morally. So he's a complex character. All the other characters, I would argue, are flat characters. Uh, the good flat characters and wicked flat characters. Uh, so um, I think that's probably the, the main distinction between the, the way satirists use characters and the way um, novelists use you know, characters. They, are, they all mix both flat yeah. and round. My characters are all flat. Left like a puncture. <laughs> <laughs> but deliberately so, and, 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 yes. and that's interesting. Um, so actually that, that leads me to um, a quote actually, that because I interviewed um, Violette uh, some time ago after she... Uh, Violette was is sort of a newcomer to, to a writing fiction and her first novel, um, Bulby Dreams, I think she received quite a bit of input from John John Apple along the way and you said I'm just going to quote over here John Apple once told me and I've never forgotten this first create your characters he said create your characters and they will lead you where they want to go they want to go uh, and that was such a pivotal moment so I don't know whether she's misquoting you John <laughs> or uh, or whether she was sort of inspired in some some way by by something that you said but maybe Violet can you elaborate on that um, so when John said it um, it was a pivotal moment because I thought to myself that sounds so like mumbo jumbo how can these people who don't exist stand up and start leading the story um, and yet when I went through that process of first creating the character and developing them I realized that they did take on a life of their own and although it was in my head and in my imagination they were actual people which I think is quite a scary thing as a writer because you are sometimes living in two worlds. You're in this world of your imagination where your characters are doing their thing and then you're coming back into real life um, and trying to function normally. Once they become um, fully, fully rounded, as John said, they really do start um, developing in their own way and um, you then are using a little bit of observation and a little bit of psychology to think, well, what would this character do next? How would he develop? How would he grow from this experience? And um, as a real human being, they do take on that life of their own. You do have to keep them believable, though, to yourself as well as to your reader. And um, think to yourself, well, in, an, in a situation, if a person went through this tragedy, how would they reflect it in their lives? So I certainly think that if it was a step-by-step step once I had the character, knowing who he was and how he would react to things around him. You followed the character. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, so Piwe, I wonder what, what your, um, your view is. Are you led by your characters or are, you, are your characters led by you? Um, I'm thinking of some of your, yeah, the genie, for example, the, the wonderful sort of magical character who everyone is, is kind of... Um, in a way mesmerized by, I would say, in the theory of flight, because she, she does just seems to have this sort of alluring magic, magical quality. Uh, I wondered what went into, how, how she, uh, how, how you, how she came about, and the other characters in that, in that novel and, and others as well. Um, do you, uh, yeah, are you sort of, do they just come to you and do they lead you or do you lead them? I, so I agree with uh, what Ian had said. Um, it's a very deep part of the story. I think that would be the most fun for so long. But um, yeah, um, <laughs> we'll grow up now. <laughs> so yeah, so the the thing is, I am led, and I allow myself to be led. I think when I try to lead, uh, writer's block happens. A lot of things just don't work the way they're supposed to. So usually, I hear. A, a, a voice saying something and then I realize that that voice is a character and then it, it goes from there so I allow myself to be there with Jeannie it was difficult because she's a very um, 
she's not a very concrete character. She seems to exist more for other people and other people than she does it herself. Mm -hmm. Which may explain why it took me 10 years to write that particular book. Because I was waiting yeah. for her to come into full view and she never did. Yeah. Um, so, but I did allow myself to be there. Wow, that's interesting. So she eventually revealed herself to you. Thank goodness. Because <laughs> she's on the page. She's unforgettable. I, I really highly recommend that novel. It's fantastic. Um, and um, Bryony, what about you? Do you? Are you sort of... How do the characters evolve in, in your book? So um, Ellie and for example, the other characters, did they sort of come to you or and, and were you led by them or did you sort of have more kind of control over their sort of development? Um, I think for, for both those characters, um, Ellie and Evelyn, they were based quite loosely on, on people who actually did exist. So I think that does help, that you've got a You've got an image in your mind. You've got an idea. Um, I know people because because the September Sun is written in, in first person. Um, they always think that it's about me, that I'm Ellie. You know, it's, it's my life. Um, and uh, what I've done is I've taken incidents from my life, but not all of them, but certain things. Um, and sometimes I've exaggerated them. Sometimes I've changed them. Um, sometimes they're the opposite of what's happened to me, but they, I suppose they, they do sort of all work together to create a different character to the one that you've actually based. You, you, you've had an idea of, um, because of somebody you, you know, but then the end product is not the person that, that you actually started with. It, it's also other things added in that change things. They become a sort of a, a fictionalized sort of um, mixture of, of kind of all sorts of possible facts yeah. here and there yes. and character. It's really interesting that. And I, it's a question that I also wanted to ask John because I, I was going to say that actually your your two main characters, Ellie and Ethan, in, in the September Sun. Um, granddaughter and grandmother who form a close bond and have overlapping stories they just seem so real to so many people and I think you've had this question yeah. oh, is it autobiographical Please. the book yeah. and it's not it's fictional so that's why that's interesting I don't know how, you, how you explain that but I also thought I'd ask John uh, because I it's, it's and you Ellie is your first person narrator if I'm not mistaken yes. in um, the September Sun, so you're you're telling the story from her perspective, and John does the same quite a lot with first first person narrators. Um, the yeah. it's Dykeberry, isn't it, from the, in the Great yeah, North that, Road? Yeah, that kind of contradicts a little bit of what I said earlier about yeah. all my characters being black. Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't think you can avoid a certain amount of autobiography, um, if not your personality, but where you grew up. You know the things that you liked and disliked. You can somehow build them into your characters almost inadvertently. Yeah. So, so yeah, there is there is an element of that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can just because my my male characters are kind of like quite similar. They're also yeah. losers yeah. in a way, <laughs> uh, which I don't call myself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it, but it, there is a, a, an aspect of me in them. Yeah, because uh, a very sort of self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's connected to a uh, whole historical center, yes. part of the colonial you know, world, the um, guilds and all that kind of thing. It kind of seeps into my characters. And there's George G. George in, in um, the um, absent English. George J. George. George J. George. His name is George George George. The <laughs> <laughs> little George is called the J. <laughs> George, George, I'm George, sorry, George. George. I think I made a error with the middle. But it's a fantastic, uh, but also there's that autobiographical kind of connection because he's an English teacher and you were, you've been a English yeah. teacher for 50 yeah. years. And But I, I, you say something, because I'm reading uh, your serialized version at the moment of the Grand Stuffed Elephant Heist yeah. on 
Facebook, which is actually a reworking of trafficking. If the truth be known. Uh, well, no, it's just a, it's a different title, but it's. I a, left it's a, out some of the ruder parts. Did you? Okay. <laughs> um, but the, I know, it's right at the beginning, you say, author's request, please don't confuse me with my objectional narrator. <laughs> I, I, I have to do that because I've, I've had such a problem over the years of being accused of being my a narrator. Yeah. You're a monster. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm only partly like that. <laughs> It's kind of interesting, though, isn't it? Sort of the, the, the pros and cons, or the, the, the challenges of yes. um, narrating your, your book through, through a, in a first person um, through one of your, your characters who's the narrator, who then may or may not be seen as being quite yeah. closely connected. Is that also a way characterization develops in the text is, is what T.S. Eliot calls the objective correlative. Mm. In other words, you use the world around the character to in a kind of metaphorical way to reflect the character. Dickens does this. Yeah. The houses people live in are like them. Yeah. This is Miss Havisham in Great Expectation. I mean, yeah. mm. the, the, the place she lives is part of her character. Yeah. Um, so, so that's also another way of, of creating characters by the setting you put them in. Yeah. And all the other ways of course like dialogue and the way they dress and the idiosyncrasies and the names you give them. You know, I mean, I keep I keep giving the examples from Dickens because he's my favourite writer. Um, but you know, he, he, the the headmaster in um, Nicholas Nickleby is called Wackford Squares. <laughs> <laughs> and in Martin Chuzzlewit, there's a there's a person who loves uh, birds. He keeps bird, canaries and birds in cages, and his name is Paul Sweedlepie. <laughs> In other words, his name sounds like a bird song. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's called onomastics. I think that's the technical term for it. And I, I do that with my names as well, characters' names. Yeah. But mine are sometimes just creatures. Yeah. Right. I don't have any connection to anything. Right. Sort of inventive names. Yeah. Very fascinating. Um, Violet, um, with your, what goes into the, the construction of your, your characters? We've talked about, you know, sort of. Um, identifying with characters to some extent, personally or not. Uh, can you talk about consciously or unconsciously, how did they emerge? A, a character like Calvin, for example, who's this, um, you know, this very kind of kind-hearted, but a bad boy who kind of gets into, into trouble and, and uh, but someone you can imagine, you know, in Bulawayo uh, at the same time. So I'm wondering if, if they're partly real or how did they come about? Well, I think that a lot of character development does start at a subconscious level, at people that you've seen, or people that you know, and then it becomes a collage or a patchwork of all those characteristics. So, in a way, you're either playing God or Frankenstein, you're putting all these parts together to make one person. And certainly my protagonist, Emma, was everything I was not. She's tall for a start. <laughs> and and I, it was very clear to me that we were two different people. And um, I enjoyed that because it was a way of kind of living in another head and imagining the world from another point of view. Um, and of course that can be difficult because I am not that person. So it does take, as I said earlier, a little bit of psychology to imagine someone who grew up in those circumstances, how they would respond things around them. But it is quite a powerful feeling to be able to bring these people out of nowhere, out of dust, and make them full-bodied. And they, I think what was interesting once, um, Paul and I drove into an event and there was a group of young women with long dark hair and he said, that's Bernice, one of the people from my character. He said, I can see them. And that was so wonderful that um, it was relatable that they were now living among us in a way um, but definitely a patchwork and a collage of many different experiences both physically and characteristic wise thanks yeah it, it seems like um, a lot goes into um, sort of trying to imagine uh, trying to get inside a character's head, I imagine, trying to think like that character. Um, and I wondered, 
Yeah, as, um, Sapiwi, maybe I can ask you this. Um, sometimes I think the novelist's, uh, the author's task is, is well, not to just create good characters, but also quite frankly bad characters or nasty characters or characters that are a little bit a combination of good and bad, a bit complicated, a bit troubling. And I, I, it struck me that um, Emil Katsia, the uh, protagonist of the history of man, is quite a difficult character to uh, to sort of inhabit and get inside, um, you know, his his head, which you, you, you do extremely well. But I, I just wondered uh, what went into that and, and how challenging it was to to write about a character that, you know, is is a combination of things, but also has quite a dark side. Um, can you tell us more about what goes into that? And how it affects you as an author, maybe, as well? Um, so, uh, for me, the creation of a meal was not as difficult as most people always seem to think. I mean, he is, in many ways, seemingly uh, an opposite kind of person to who I am, right, in many ways, racially, you know, gender-wise, um, but I think there are lots of moments of similarity of analogy, and I think that's where the autobiographical that writing is for me, uh, comes in. So he went to boarding school, I went to boarding school, he didn't have a great experience in boarding school, I, so when you have those building blocks and you can actually connect with that character on that level, then the complexity mm -hmm. is something that you can live in a lot because then you, you have that common ground. Uh, if I was trying to create someone that I had never seen or heard, which is also why it's important to, I think writers are essentially a truly <laughs> observant people, right? We, we, we are paying attention to mannerisms, what people say, what they don't say, where they're looking when they speak, all those things. Um, and so when you're writing, all those things come together. But I think that for me, at least, there has to be a meeting point with all my characters something that allows me to understand them and empathize with them. That, that has so even if a character seems like they're very much like me or very different from me, they're not seeing them. And so even with a male char uh, a male's character, they have to be that Yeah, that's that. Yeah. One of the things I think that's very important is that the writer leaves gaps in, in the development of the character for the reader to fill in. And um, Spiele does that really well, especially with very, very detailed characters. I think they're called aporias, the gap in the text, which, you know, that's, really, that, that, that's why different people will have a different response to a certain literary character, because they, they, they might differ in the gaps, the parts of the, the person's story that the writer hasn't said anything about that makes us think about. And that creates another enrichment because then the reader is characterizing as well. Yeah. And the reader starts taking over. You know, and I think that's the sign of a really uh, successful character in a novel is when it does create these aporias in, 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 in the characterization. That's interesting. So you're sort of saying the reader creates the character as well, Partly. in a way. Yeah, no, yeah. If it's, a, if, it, if it's an interesting character. Yeah. yeah relates to that character yeah. in, in yeah. a particular way at least. Yeah. Which is probably why some different readers can see a character in a different yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Someone will have a positive interaction or yeah. experience. And that's, that's realistic because that's yeah. what human beings are thinking. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Some people will like you yeah. and Lots some will hate you. Yeah. So well, despite one's best attempts as an author to create a negative character, they may well you know, end up being quite well liked or by some people. Or relatable. Yeah. Yeah. relatable. Um, that's interesting. Um, it sort of leads me to another question that I wanted to ask um, Bryony, actually, um, which is about um, misfitting characters. So I, I asked you about the difficult characters to sort of create or, or identify with or um, uh, put them onto the page. And it seems to me that, um, particularly in All Come to Dust, um, the, uh, the, there's uh, Chief Inspector Edmund Dube and Craig Martin, and there are others as well, who are, although they appear like that they're sort of established uh, members of the community, they're actually misfits. And um, 
you you sort of explore the way uh, that they, they that they are misfits in in society and they, they don't feel like they they kind of uh, belong can you say some more about that what's what